quarter of a million people have been living under siege in Aleppo. And they've been told they can leave at a number of checkpoints. But they've also been warned to stay away from so-called terrorist positions. Well, human rights activists are saying that overnight at least 30 people died. Meanwhile, talks to try to find a way out of the crisis are continuing in New York. But the situation's looking bleak. Our Middle East correspondent Quentin Somerville has this report. They've grown used to destruction in Aleppo, but never on this scale. This man says a woman was killed here where three houses once stood. In the ruins of Syria's ceasefire, eastern Aleppo is being flattened. Here they say they've never heard a louder explosion. And when the dust settles, and with a wary eye on the skies overhead, they search for bodies. Here in the dirt, in the doorway of a house, they've spotted the head of a baby boy. The rescue workers have to move quickly before another airstrike. Gently, they take away the stone and the dust, and they have him, and he's alive. The hospitals here are being overwhelmed again. They've lost six medical staff over the past two days of bombing. There have been nearly 250 airstrikes in the past 24 hours. And in Aleppo, it's not just civilians who are being targeted, but their rescuers too. Above, the sound of aircraft that have just bombed the Al Ansari neighborhood. This is a base for the Civil Defense Force, the White Helmets. Three of their rescue centers were bombed. There have been more than 25 raids since 5 this morning. Civil defense teams were heading to rescue people from under the rubble and firefighters were here. Four vehicles were damaged and the fire engine was destroyed. We also lost an ambulance. The bombings have been relentless. The Syrian regime and its allies are now preparing for a ground offensive. This morning we heard an earthquake, went out and saw a huge hole in the ground. We thought, my God, what is this? What are we to him? Why does Assad hit us like this? May God have revenge on him, that oppressor. Dozens have been killed in the past 48 hours. We can't see how many. They're still looking for the dead and the missing. The ceasefire didn't achieve peace. It may just have given Russia and regime forces time to regroup and prepare for one final push on Aleppo. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Beirut. Well, we're going to talk now to a journalist who's in uh, Aleppo for us right now. This is the American journalist Bilal Abdul Karim, who's on the line. Uh, Bilal, thank you very much for being with us. What is the situation there tonight? Well, the situation is as bleak as it has been, that I can remember that it's been. There are an unprecedented number of airstrikes that have been landing on the city. Um, I cannot tell you how many casualties there are because um, I don't think any one person knows that because there are still bodies under the rubble. Uh, but, you know, just from last night, I'd probably say in the last 24 hours, there's probably been about 65, 70 airstrikes. And that's no exaggeration. That's a conservative estimate. Uh, Bilal, I think you filmed some footage that we've received here at the BBC, so we're just going to show a little bit about of that and then I'll ask you about it. So let's just see that footage. So a huge explosion there as you were conducting that interview. Could you just tell us what was going on, where you were, who you were talking to? We were trying to conduct an interview with the uh, with the representative of the White Helmets. Uh, we wanted to get their side of what happened, as the uh, news brief that you just played uh, uh, um, clearly stated. Three of their four stations were hit today. Now, can we really say that the White Helmets are now a terrorist organization as well? Bashar al-Assad said that the people should stay away from these. Uh, should stay away from the terrorists or stay away from the rebels and such like that. The people who pull the people out from underneath the uh, rubble, 
that the government causes by their missiles, so they're terrorists as well. Um, you know, as I'm conducting the interview, all of a sudden we hear this huge explosion behind us, and I felt the blast wave. Um, and I was just thinking that maybe uh, some shrapnel would have would have gotten into me or something like that. But um, alhamdulillah, that didn't happen. Uh, there was a wall that was there. I think that that wall and the fact that it was just slightly uh, to the left a little bit, that the shrapnel um, didn't come and, and change or end all of our lives. Uh, and just to be clear, for those viewers who don't know about the White Helmets, essentially they're a volunteer rescue group. But uh, can I just ask you, we've seen some, also some footage today, terrible harrowing footage of children being pulled from the rubble after some of these um, airstrikes or explosions in the city. And, and as usual, it's the uh, children often who are suffering so terribly. Um, yes. Well, firstly, I mean, you know, seeing all of these explosions is the price that journalists have to pay to cover the story here so that people even know about these children. You know, it's so difficult to understand because so many people that are watching this uh, newscast are people who are in a house who have heat, hot water, food to eat, but you're dealing with uh, you're watching people who do not have any of these things. They don't have medicine. They don't have anything. And on top of all of that, there are airstrikes that are being carried out by weapons. And I'm going to tell you that over the past two days, I've been seeing weapons and destruction that I didn't see before. There's a new type of missile that they have that embeds itself into the earth. It detonates four or five different explosions and then it brings the building down. So it's no more of the barrel bombs, it seems, or at least uh, at some uh, sometimes it's not uh, a barrel bomb. Uh, but the barrel bomb would destroy a portion of the house. And if you happen to be in that area of the house that was destroyed, then, of course, you would be killed. However, this is a different uh, kettle of fish entirely because it embeds itself into the earth and then it, it, it creates an earthquake that basically if the blast doesn't, doesn't get you, then the shaking of the uh, structure is going to collapse it down on top of your head. Well, thank you very much for painting a really harrowing picture of uh, life in Aleppo at the moment. That's Bilal Abdul Karim, American journalist there. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Well, on the diplomatic front, uh, in terms of the Syria crisis, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has been talking at the United Nations in New York, and he condemned attacks by opposition forces and defended the Syrian government's military operations. Unfortunately, the ideas of uh, mentoring, supremacy, exclusiveness, Realization of one's own interests by any means uh, which have been deeply uh, rooted in the minds of political elites of a number of Western countries to the detriment of our efforts to promote equitable cooperation. The outcome of arrogant attitudes and feelings of uh, infallibility in pushing forward unilateral and reckless solutions, we see this in the bleeding Middle East and North Africa. As a result, the foundations of world stability are being destroyed. It is high time to learn lessons and prevent a slipping down to catastrophe, catastrophe in Syria. Many, th mainly thanks to Russia's military assistance at uh, the Syrian legitimate government's uh, request, it became possible to prevent the collapse of statehood and disintegration of that country under the onslaught of terrorists so that the Syrians could determine the future of the country themselves through an inclusive dialogue of all ethnic and religious groups. This course uh, was recorded, to which there is no alternative. It was set down at the UN Security Council resolutions and was embodied in recent agreements between Russia and the United States as co-chairs of the International Series Support Group. Now it is essential to prevent the disruption of these agreements and to carry out unbiased and impartial investigation of the incidents in Deir Ezzor and Aleppo that undermine these agreements. So that's Sergei Lavrov, the Russian Foreign Minister. Let's go to Laura Trevelyan, our correspondent at the United Nations in New York for us. So, uh, Laura, we've seen this new Syrian government bombardment in Aleppo. The ceasefire there appears to be in tatters.
but meanwhile diplomatic efforts there where you are are continuing is there any hope between uh, john kerry and sergey lavrov getting any kind of new ceasefire arrangement well, no one here is particularly optimistic that that's the case. The two men did meet earlier today, and the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said afterwards that they'd made a little bit of progress. What that progress was, we don't know. And you just played that clip there of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov addressing world leaders at the General Assembly. Then he held a press conference for reporters, and in that, he blamed the United States for failing to control the rebels that it's backing. Uh, he said that it was rebel breaches of the ceasefire in Aleppo which had left Syria's government in a position of having to defend itself. So you can see that there's this whole blame game which is going on. Uh, the US has blamed the Russians for that attack on the humanitarian convoy the United Nations won on Monday. The Russians are still talking about the American attack on Syrian troops on Saturday, which the Americans have apologized for and said it was a mistake but admitted that they did it. Uh, uh, the only thing the two sides do agree on, Ben, is the fact that the U.S.-Russia ceasefire agreement, in tatters though it is, that it, there's no alternative to it and that it must somehow be revived. But I would say the feeling here at UN headquarters in New York is that the window for any new initiative is really closing because the U.S. election is looming and the clock is running out on the Obama administration. All right, Laura, thank you very much. Laura Trevelyan there with the very latest from the UN in New York. Now, just to say, we're going to be